vowel qualities of contrasts. English vowels. I'm dividing this lecture into three parts. The first part is moderately technical to attract the interest of everybody. The second part is very easy, especially for beginners. And the third part is more difficult. So they can go to school. So first of all, I want to talk about the distribution of vowel sounds. That means the positions in which we find them, the kinds of syllables in which they can occur. Because we have an important division in English, and indeed in all the Germanic languages, between two classes of vowels. If we consider which vowel sounds can be found in open syllables, that is, syllables with no final consonants, we notice straight away that most of the vowels can be found there. So we have syllables such as C, bar, stir, day, no, transcribed there, which show that all the long vowels and the difficulties of English sit very happily in these open syllables. On the other hand, when we consider the possibilities such as sit, back, stop, death, not. We find that these are not possible as isolated words in English, not possible as stressed, separate word structures. It's perfectly okay as long as there is a final consonant. So we have syllables such as sip, indeed words, sip, bad, stuck, death, knock. <coughs> and what I conclude from this is that the short vowels need something following them. In the case of a monosyllable, they need a coda, that is, a final consonant. So on the top, the long vowels and diphthongs don't need a coda consonant, whereas the short vowels do. And this gives us grounds which have nothing to do with actual vowel length, grounds for distinguishing between the generality, the long vowels and diphthongs, and the special ones, the short vowels. I'm talking always about stressable vowels here, strong vowels. So remember that name, coda, for the final consonant, which makes it possible to have a short vowel. There from the <coughs> The pronunciation dictionary are the vowel charts that I give of the different vowel sounds. We're not going to go through those in detail just at the moment, but you can refer to them. And those of you who are in the IPA class or other advanced classes will need to know and understand those diagrams, which show the tongue position of the various vowels. <coughs> okay. Now we've got the easy part of the lecture. I'm just going to go through the different vowel sounds that we have in English and exemplify <coughs> each of them. It is not necessary to write down all the words from every slide. There won't be time, probably, to write them all down. So first of all, we've got the short vowel I, the kit vowel, which comes, as you can see, in the words kit, bid, in, minute, finishing, and there is a drum kit <coughs> animating the word. Second vowel is the N of dress, as in dress, bed, head, many, redhead. And as Mr. Ashby said the other day, note also the different possibilities of spelling, because many of our vowels can be spelt in a variety of different ways, and all of our vowel letters can be interpreted in read in a variety of different ways. So that's A. <coughs> Next one, A, as in trap. So we have trap, bad, carry, canal, and pan. And we've 
very few, very obscure exceptions, this vowel is always spelled with the letter A. That's a mouse trap, but for some reason it has a dollar <coughs> bill. <laughs> this is the strut vowel. Strut, mud, love, love, double, shut up. And there's a picture of a strut holding something up. I say it is not necessary to write down all these words in each case. <coughs> Next is the lot vowel. Lot, odd, what? Oh, sorry, wash, and then stopwatch, cross, and squad. <coughs> Let's ignore that. And we don't have to use email messages, that's the trouble about being online. <coughs> oh, the foot now. Foot, good, put, couldn't, full, book. Those then are the short vowels. The ones that require a following coda consonant. Kit, dress, trap, <coughs> lot, strut, foot. <coughs> so let's move on now to the long vowels and diphthongs. The fleece vowel, fleece, see, machine, see, complete, dream. That garment is called a fleece, if you look in the shop to see the Here's the face vowel, a, diphthong. <coughs> face, say, break, train, payday, faded. <coughs> and the one that everybody finds easy, the I vowel, the I diphthong, Christ, I, <coughs> try. <coughs> Tidy, white wine. And choice now, choice, boy, noisy, boiler, enjoyable. So there they are, the long vowels, they're the second box on your handout sheet in the book, that's page 26 in the book. <coughs> These are the long vowels that move towards or are at high front time position. Now, what's important about the vowels is not just the quality of each one separately, but probably more importantly the contrasts, the distinctions between them. Your practical class teacher will, if necessary, drill you on hearing and making the contrasts between different vowels. Here, for example, is a pair that gives difficulty to many learners. The difference between a sheep and a ship. There on the <coughs> left, we have a sheep. On the right, we have a ship. So, just for practice, when everybody point to the sheep, point to the sheep, please. Go on, do it. Point, that's right, point to the sheep. And now point to the ship. Point to the ship. Okay, now point to the right one when I say a ship. <coughs> and a sheep. And a sheep. And a sheep. And a ship. Good. Well done. <laughs> That's the kind of practical exercise you can do if you're, if you're a teacher, you can do with that with, with your pupils. Sometimes people say, oh, phonetics is very difficult, very hard, it's dry, <coughs> don't want to worry with that. Well, you don't have to teach people phonetics, but what you can do is teach them pronunciation. And that's the kind of exercise that you, <coughs> understanding the phonetics, can do with any class of learners of English, from beginners, up to advanced students. Even excellent speakers of English sometimes find this difficult. There are some more middle pairs. Green, grin. Cheek, chick. <coughs> Read, rid. One thing I would recommend is that when you use these in class, be careful to use the same intonation for each of the two members of the pair. 
So don't say sheep and ship, which is the usual listing intonation of a rise and a fall. Treat each one as a completion, a complete thing on its own. So sheep and then ship. Each one has a fall and a In the textbooks, you can find this kind of thing. This is from the uh, stuff at the back of your uh, booklet, your course booklet, where we have uh, a number of minimal pairs for, uh, for this contrast. D, did, leave, live, these, is, read, rid, be, bin, beat, bit, sheep, ship, seek, sit, deep, dip, reach, itch. So without pictures. Uh, particularly, I would draw the attention of speakers of Spanish, for example, to the contrast between these and this. These is plural, this is singular. In Spanish English, both of them become this. And although we understand you, if, we see, if you say this book and this book, it annoys us. It's uh, something we have to make concessions about. If you want to be understood easily without you say, annoying your listeners, then you must say, these books differ from this book. Okay, let's get back to the vowel. The <coughs> long back vowel, the oo, the goose. The way I say it, goose, <coughs> two, blue, group, new, beauty. But as Michael Ashby told you the other day, this is a vowel that is in the process of change. And my pronunciation is now becoming old-fashioned. Let me imitate the newer pronunciation, which is not my own. Goose, two, blue, group, new, beauty. I don't think you need to worry about that difference, but you should be able to understand people, even if they say goose or even goose. <laughs> and when people say, hello. Who are you? <laughs> no, I say you. <laughs> the O vowel. This is another one that's a bit variable. The way I say it is O. Goat. Show. No. Rope. Over. Oh dear. <laughs> the actually says stone. For some reason it says faded. So I'll write that later. And old. Now, just let's look at the last one there, old, because this is an important change in progress. It's been going on for centuries, but it's recently changed status. When I was a boy, people like me, educated people, didn't say old. We said old. But younger people now more and more say old. And we've had a very interesting recent piece of research done about British television announcers, newsreaders, who speak in a standard way, analyzing the proportion who actually say old and rather old. And it's up to halfway. It's now half as common for educated, good speakers like television newsreaders to say old when the following sound is an L. So cold, the cold. I told you before, I told you, but not in other positions. So you can't say got, shawl, for example, there, uh, goat, show. Here is the mouth vowel. Mouth, now, shout, powder, downtown. <coughs> there they are, all three of them, goose. Goat, mouth. These are the three long vowels and diphthongs that tend towards a high back area. <coughs> then we have the further group, the near vowel. Couldn't really find a nice picture for near, so there's a, a sheep with two lambs standing near it. <laughs> near, near, <coughs> weary, dear, severe, period. I always think it's more fun to have pictures when you have audiovisual materials. If you're making similar things for your own students, 
we now have a marvelous new source of pictures, which is Google <laughs> Images, which is where all of these pictures come from. Just put in the keyword, look at some of the results, and you'll probably find a nice picture that you can use. Air. Air. Square. Fair. Various. Prepared. Despair. This vowel again is changing a bit. I, as you can hear, use a diphthong air. The two elements start air and becomes fur. However, the trend nowadays is more and more to pronounce it as a monophthong, as a long, steady air, and therefore to say square, fair, various, prepared, despairing. You can do that if you prefer. Uh, I don't think it's necessary to change the transcription, but you will find one or two dictionaries now that have changed the transcription into something showing just a long one. Ah, oh, this is an easy vowel. Start, father, farmer, banana, the last half. In uh, received pronunciation, the form of pronunciation that we teach you, this is used without a following R sound in words like start. But many accents, including American English, of course, do have an R consonant and say start, father, farmer. And some accents have A rather than R. Words like banana in the last half. We say banana in the last half. Then the nurse vowel, uh, long mid central vowel, nurse, <coughs> stir, learn, prefer, earn, turning, service. A rather rare vowel among the languages of the world, at least as a long, steady monophthong, stressable, uh, and in American English, of course, it has er, R coloration, American nurse, stir, learn, refer, earn, turn in, service. Important for the Japanese in particular to make a difference <coughs> between R, start, and er, uh, nurse. Japanese for service is sabi. <laughs> That will not be easily understood by non-Japanese speakers of English. Sir, sir, not sir. Then the all vowel, thought, law, north, <coughs> war, forces, author, order. Uh, we use this vowel in thought and also in words of the sets north and force, other accents divide that somewhat differently. You'll notice that this is a pretty well lip-rounded vowel <coughs> in my kind of pronunciation. You can see my lips all round thought, force, or, or, or. <coughs> Lastly, we've got the ur vowel, diphthong, ur, cure, poor, sure, jury, tourist, Furious. Again, change is underway. More and more in England, people pronounce these words with an or instead of with ur. So, poor changes to poor. Sure changes to sure. <coughs> and there are other people who uh, do other things with it, but it's a variable area, shall we say. Tourists can become tourists. In jury, we are more likely to get monophoning, thus jury, jury. Don't worry about these different possibilities. It's quite safe to use for. So then we have our six remaining vowels, the central tending on vowels and monophthongs. Reading across, near, cure, square, nurse, thought, and start. Okay, <clears throat> if you'd just like to refer to your handout again, page 26, you can see there are the tables setting out these vowels in a phonetically logical order. Now those are the strong vowels. <coughs> it's 
seems to me helpful, though, to analyze English as having two classes of vowels, strong vowels and weak vowels. Mr. Ashby mentioned this in his introductory lecture. The strong vowels are the ones that can be stressed, though they're not necessarily stressed. More than that, they can also therefore be accented in different intonational problems. But we also have vowels that are not stressable, that can't be stressed, and which we therefore call weak. And here in particular, we deal with the three that you see on the screen at the moment, the E, the U, and the E. The E, called schwa, common standards for the bananas, several occurrences in that case. The E that Michael wants us to call shui, as in the end of happy. And the U wants us to call shu, in the end of thank you. Let's look at those three. Here's our E, uh, shua. They're stressed, but in lots of unstressed positions. Bananas. 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 Collection. Uh, uh, collection. Collection. Common mistake to say bananas <laughs> or collection. No, we don't say bananas, we say bananas. 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 And we don't say collection, we say collection. 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 Don't be misled by the spell which suggests the same vowel. <coughs> at the beginning and end of bananas, and at the beginning and end of collection. Well, they are the same vowel, but they're the schwa, and they're not the same as the vowel in the middle. <coughs> comma, punctuation mark, comma, comma, uh, uh, standard, <coughs> the, the standard. Okay, Americans are going to say standard, but again, it's perfect. A weak vowel. <coughs> In the phrase some fish and chips, some fish and chips, you can see weak uh, first and the third word, some fish and chips. We don't normally say some fish and chips, we say some fish and chips. When you're getting your meal from the refectory <coughs> counter, don't say some fish. It sounds very strange, as if you're making a difference between some fish and other fish, uh, or some remarkable fish. <laughs> when you just say some fish, say some fish, some fish, or for that matter, some bananas. These are the weak forms of a number of, uh, of, a number of content words that have these special weak pronunciations that we'll hear about. Okay, here's the happy vowel. Now, if we take pairs of words like green and grin, sleep and slip, feeling and filling, there, of course, we need to make that contrast, sheep, ship, in strong, stressable <coughs> position. But at the end of happy, coffee, valid, and before another vowel in glorious, at the end of tell me, in those positions, that contrast disappears. We don't need to make it. And in fact, you could use an E quality, happy. Or you could use an E quality, happy. And it doesn't matter. And native speakers may use one or the other, or something really that's intermediate between the two of them, or that's difficult to identify. It doesn't matter. So whereas for green, we use the letter I with the two dots in the transcription, for grin, we use the small gap I in the transcription. At the end of happy, we use just an ordinary letter I. And I say it doesn't matter here which quality you use. In earlier work, and still in some dictionaries and so on, you will find the small cap I, or the equivalent for the short vowel, at the end of words like <coughs> happy, coffee. Well, that's fine for the pronunciation of 100 years ago. And indeed for my pronunciation, but I'm very old. Uh, but it's not really appropriate, appropriate for most of the students that I've been teaching recently, recently, 
because their pronunciation has now typically changed. Not for everybody, but very commonly so. It doesn't matter, though, which you use. Just know about the variability. Testing applies to the back vowel, the U vowel. Very important, well, pretty important, to make the difference between food and good, look and look, shoot and put. <coughs> Well, I say very important. It's actually not all that important because the Scottish people don't make any such distinction and we still understand them. Anyhow, at the end of thank you, we don't normally say thank you. I mean, or I'd you contrast it, you could say, okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Special <coughs> prominence given in the intonation under certain circumstances. But normally we say thank you. Yo, 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 yo. Thank you. And it's weak. Situation, influence, stimulate, to accept. And really, it doesn't matter whether you think of that as ooh or as o oh, or as something intermediate, because different people do different things. And at speed, influence, how can you decide which it is? Right. Well, from now on, we look at slightly more technical <coughs> issues concerned with these vowels. If you now return, uh, look at your uh, page in your book, which is exactly the same as what is on the screen. So this is section two in the book. General points then, which we've already covered about schwa, i, and u. And then in smaller print, Neutralization. This is a technical term in phonetics phonology, meaning that a phonemic contrast that is made in certain positions is suspended, not made, neutralized in other positions. And you can exemplify this <coughs> phenomenon from all sorts of different languages. Uh, people often talk about pin, bin, and spin, where in spin in English the bilingual closer to p in fact, could be analyzed as a P or as a B. Chinese learners always think it's a kind of B when they listen to it. But anyhow, we hear it as a kind of P, but a voice as well. But the contrast between P and B is neutralized after S. Similarly, the contrast between, U, uh, between E and E, sheep and chip, is neutralized in these final positions like happy. And this is demonstrated, first of all, by same speaker fluctuation. Given person, sometimes says happy, sometimes says happy. By the use of phonetically intermediate sounds, happy, which is it? Don't know. And by the use of indeterminate sounds, can't hear which. Uh, this carries over into inflected forms. Uh, so you can get babies or babies, carried or carried, dirtying or dirtying. Pretty or prettier. Though I have to say that speakers who do one thing in uninflected forms don't necessarily do the same thing in the inflected forms. But the take home message again for EFL is it doesn't matter exactly what you do as long as it's in the right area. More importantly, perhaps notice the difference between strong vowels and weak vowels when we compare. Examples such as an insert. Now the verb is to insert something. But if when you buy a magazine there's a separate sheet of paper that's been inserted in it, this is called an insert. And it has cert with strong er uh, in its second syllable. Compare that with going to a concert. Concert, where concert has an ordinary schwa in the second syllable. So insert, concert. Insert, insert. There is a difference between a strong vowel and a weak vowel. Similarly, when we take the word pedigree, that has got to end in E, strong E, pedigree. Nobody says pedigree. On the other hand, people do say mimicry. Other people say mimicry. And for some people, pedigree and mimicry sound really the end, the same at the end. But not for me, I say pedigree, mimicry. So that's again this strong versus weak contrast. Cuckoo has to have oo at the end, strong oo, cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Thank you, on the other hand, as we've seen, doesn't. 
Okay, section three. I'll now hand it out. What's all this about weak and strong? Well, this is a value really only if we recognize processes of weakening. And in English, it's clear that it's helpful to describe bowels as undergoing weakening in certain positions, which means that we switch from the strong E to the weak E. And similarly from strong A to weak E. We can see this, first of all, if we look at words that are morphologically related. They belong in the same place in the dictionary, but they have different parts of speech. So if we take the example there from anatomic and compare this with anatomy. Okay, anatomic is the adjective, anatomy <coughs> is the noun. And you can see I think I've got a separate slide about this, yes. <coughs> when we transcribe them, anatomy, anatomical, and compare that with the spelling, that the letter A at the beginning of anatomy stands for a schwa, but at the beginning of anatomical it stands for an. The second letter A in anatomy stands for an. <coughs> but in anatomical stands for the schwa. What's going on? Well, clearly, it depends upon the stress. When the syllable is stressed, we use a strong bar. So in this case, an. When the syllable is unstressed, we use a weak vowel. Now, be careful. It is not the case that every unstressed syllable has a weak vowel, but some of them do. And we often see it in this kind of pair of words. Uh, we've also got between the T and the M the letter O, pronunciation schwa in anatomy, to me, to me, I'm stressed, but op in the uh, strong lot vowel in anatomical, where it's stress, anatomical. So back to that screen. Related words, anatomic anatomy, democratic Democracy, variety, vary and variant. Uh, you can see strong I, weak E. The weak one is the happy part. Immune, but immunize. Compete, competitive, competition. More complicated than that even. In that set of words, compete, competitive, <laughs> competition, we can see the strong long pronunciation compete, the strong <coughs> short pronunciation in competitive, and the weak pronunciation in competition. All spelled in the same way. And so I apologize on behalf of the English spelling system, which really is very difficult in this regard, because quite apart from words with irregular spelling, even irregularities allow these three possibilities for the same spelling in morphologically related words. And people who argue about whether we should reform our spelling or not say, oh, but it's terribly important to show that morphological related words are related by spelling them in the same way. I think that's nonsense. I think life, life would be easier, certainly for you, if we were to spell in a way that is closer to our uh, actual pronunciation. OK, let's move on to function words. We know we have 30 or so very common words where we have two pronunciations, a strong form and a weak form. And so we have these words like can, be able. <coughs> but if you have a sentence like I can do it, we normally weaken it from can to can. <coughs> I can do it. I can do it. What can I say? What can I say? Foreigner's pronunciation, what can I say? Native pronunciation, what can I say? <coughs> Weak form, can. Can, can. <coughs> of. Weak form, of. A cup of tea. Foreigner's pronunciation, a cup of tea. Native pronunciation, <coughs> cup of tea. Then, we form them. Tell them what to do. 
tell them, 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 tell them what to do. <coughs> ah, we form earth. What are they doing? What are, what, are, what are they doing? And we even have this with me, as we saw, give me, <coughs> not give me, it's just a switch from the fleece valve to the happy valve. May not be important at all from the point of view of VFL, but it's there. And likewise from the strong goose valve in you, strong form, to the weak form uh, with the thank you valve. Thank you. Now, strong and weak, okay? Morphologically related words, function words, but also there are a number of words with two possible pronunciations, where the choice really is between using a strong vowel and using a weak vowel. And this is most easily seen in the names of the days of the week. Do we call them Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or do we call them Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? It doesn't matter. A given speaker, me for example, is likely to be inconsistent. Or when there's some reason to make it more salient, we say day, I'll do it on Monday. But I'll do it on Monday morning. Monday morning in a, in a fixed place. The point being that we have a free choice about vowel strength here. Likewise with the beginning of the month of November. Is it strong? November. November. August, let's make them strong. August, September, October, November, December. Or we're going to say August, September. <clears throat> have to keep off strong, I think. October, November, Kanadashwan. So there's some choice here. Even there are special things that happen in singing. At least in classical singing and in hymn singing in church. And my example here is the word angel, normally pronounced with a weak second vowel, angel, <coughs> angel, which may or may not coalesce into the syllabic concept, <coughs> or angel. But when you're singing hymns, you will hear people singing, angels from the realms of glory. And in singing hymns and carols, all vowels are strong, if they possibly can be. All the function words have their strong forms. Even words like angel, which don't really have a strong possibility at all in ordinary speech, can strengthen up their vowel. Okay, section four on our handout. We can say that the weak vowel system <coughs> operates in certain unstressed syllables. And uh, here are a fewer vowels contrasted you are members of the system than in the strong system. <coughs> We've already identified three obvious members of this system, the shui, the shu, the shua. But, again, English is complicated because it's clear we also have to recognize the possibility of i and u being weak vowels, so that they can be both strong and weak vowels. They belong to both systems. <coughs> After all, in a word like finishing, Fin, okay, that's got to be strong. But in the other two positions, really that's where we would expect weak vowels. Finishing. But what we have is it, finishing. Basic. Valid. Distress. There are further grounds for regarding this as a weak i when we consider what happens in Australian English. The word valid, for example, in Australian is pronounced valid. Valor. And it being for Americans is often valor. So that it rhymes with salad. Now everybody has a schwa in the second syllable of salad. And for those who make valor rhyme with it, that's because they have a smaller, weak vowel system. They don't have any in their weak vowel system. Whereas those of us who say valid, it must be because we have it as one of the possibilities. Possible, possible that is in our weak vowel system. And there is quite a variability. You may have come across the Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English that uses a special double-decker symbol with i and schwa one on top of the other to show that you can use whichever weak vowel you choose there, but not a strong vowel. 
So, same thing with those stimulus, executive, virulent, or virulent. Uh, I think that means that we have a, a weak vowel system with five <coughs> terms in it, therefore, the it, the book, the er, uh, and also in the four. Now, this has implications for words that have weak forms. Since we have strong them, we the, you would expect us to have strong it, weak. Well, Australians have weak but on the say stop, stop, stop. But we don't say stop it, we say stop it. And it sounds just like the strong form. So I would say the strong form and the weak form of it are phonetically identical. But it so happens that you, know, you can't hear a difference between them. But in other varieties of English, perhaps you can. <coughs> Gets complicated, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, the last and rather important point on this screen, 4.3. A stressed syllable, yes, must contain a strong vowel. But the converse does not hold. Oh, that is, an unstressed syllable doesn't have to have a weak vowel. Because we have quite a lot of words in English where we have a strong vowel, <coughs> unstressed syllable. So we have these compound words like bedtime, a bedtime story. Unstressed, but nevertheless it's I. We don't weaken it to a bedtime story. It remains strong. In most of these ordinary compounds made out of two nines, you don't get any weakening. So one or two where we hesitate. For example, do we go to have a holiday in Thailand or in Thailand? And you can hear both of these possibilities, strong or weak land. Usually they're strong. There are these funny words like acorn, which you might think ought to be pronounced a corn or acorn. No, it isn't. It's acorn. Acorn, a strong corn. My colleagues. We don't weaken it to colleagues, and we don't change the stress to colleagues. We call it colleagues. Colleague. Of the chemical is sulfate. All those eight chemicals have strong eight. I'm stressed. Gymnast. Compare modest, where we weaken, we don't say modest, we say modest, but gymnast, we don't say gymnast. <coughs> Torment. Most of the meant words weaken to most government, enjoyment, entertainment, but torment is an exception. Okay, last point, syllabic consonants. In your list of symbols, you may have noticed that we had two strange members of the vowel column, which are the syllabic N and L. Now, in my analysis, what's going on here is we basically have an underlying schwa plus an N, so that I see the word suddenly as basically having that pronunciation, suddenly, between the different terms. In the practice, what we normally say is suddenly, 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 suddenly. And we go straight from D to N, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, the word still has three syllables, suddenly, suddenly. So what we have here is a consonant that is <coughs> syllabic, that makes a syllable on its own. Usually, to have a syllable, you've got to have a vowel. But suddenly we don't need a vowel, we've got the syllabic N. But it's still, in my view, recoverable, but it's underlyingly um, suddenly. And indeed, there are lots of other words, do have a screen or not? Yes. Uh, where we have the same thing with other consonants, rather rarely with N. Blossom, you can say blossom, or you can say blossom. Quite often with L, medal. <coughs> You could say medal, but I'd rather you didn't. I'd rather you said medal. And uh, even with R in a word like gathering, you could make it into gathering, kind of syllabic er. That's, of course, very common in American English, where a word like father, you can think of that as father, but they normally make it into a syllabic R, father. There are Quite a lot of words where some speakers do this and some speakers don't. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, is it going to be seven or is it going to be seven? Seven, 
as a schwa on an M, seven as a syllabic M. Doesn't matter. You can do whichever you prefer, and we're not worried. As long as you don't say seven with a strong F, that would be wrong. But seven with a schwa, or seven with a syllabic consonant, I don't think it matters at all. So it's helpful to think of this as an alternation. We shall see later, whenever it is my next lecture about science, how this then has further consequences. For now, that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.